OK, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to our WMG Steel Group Colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Ed Pickering from University of Manchester. He's going to deliver a talk today. Ed is currently working as senior lecturer in the Department of Materials at the University of Manchester. And his research interests are mainly alloy design and characterization microstructure property correlations in steels as well as in high entropy alloys. Ed completed his undergraduate degree as well as PhD both from University of Cambridge. And after completing his uh, uh, PhD, he started his academic career as lecturer at University of Manchester from 2015. And currently he is now promoted to senior lecturer and also a research lead for advanced metals processing theme for Henry Royce Institute. Ed is going to talk today about the uh, application of high entropy alloys for nuclear uh, reactors. And thank you, Ed, for taking time and accepting our invitation. And stage is yours now. Thank you very much, Prakash. Thank you very much for the invitation and to everybody at WMG for hosting me. Let me just pick the right window to share, and we'll, then we'll get cracking. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that okay? Can you see that yeah, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, so yeah, and um, thanks very much again for, for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today not about any of my steels work, which probably most of you are, uh, um, uh, or are already quite familiar with some of the themes that are in my steels research. I thought I'd talk to you about something that might be a little bit different and new to people, uh, which is about high entropy alloys and specifically the properties of high for nuclear applications. This is the presentation structure, so I'm actually going to um, talk, begin by talking about a, a high entropy alloys generally, so a general introduction to high entropy alloys, and we're going to talk about something called the four core effects that exist in uh, high entropy alloys, or are supposed to exist in the high entropy alloys. And then I'll, I'll talk about high entropy alloys for, for nuclear, motivation, asking whether they possess special irradiation properties, um, talking about how uh, the design considerations we have for nuclear before um, uh, talking about my group's own uh, research, which is on low activation uh, vanadium based um, body centered cubic high entropy alloys before summarizing. So a lot of the stuff to begin with, I should say, is uh, is is work. Um, uh, I'm going to refer to work in the literature as well as from my own work. Um, and then uh, at the end there, I'll, I'll talk very specifically about uh, my uh, my own group's work. And um, so this is obviously, obviously my own, isn't my own work. This is work that I've uh, collaborated with lots of different people with from the University Cambridge, from Sheffield, Oxford, and uh, yeah, here are some postdocs and um, PhD students who have carried out some of the uh, investigations and the results that you're going to see. Um, so, high entropy alloys. What are high entropy alloys? So, high entropy alloys are alloys with multiple principal alloying elements. Um, typically, we have five or more of these alloying elements, and they're very often in near equiatomic ratios. Um, so, the def one definition is that there has to be at least five uh, atomic percent of each uh, alloying element. But so it's between five and thirty-five atomic percent uh, of each alloying element. But actually, um, usually, very often, you find that they're in equiatomic uh, ratios, um, and um, uh, that's just the, the alloys that we've looked at. So, in other words, so they're called high entropy alloys because because if they happen to form solid solutions, they should have very high entropies of mixing. OK, so high configurational entropy of some mixing. So I, I mentioned just now that, you know, the, the, some of the most common high, commonly studied high entropy alloys are equiatomic alloys. And this one, um, uh, uh, the top here is uh, an alloy called Cant uh, that's, that's uh, um, uh, called, uh, referred to often as Cantor's alloy that was um, first studied by Brian Cantor, um, as many of you will know. Um, and so this is just 20 atomic percent of each of the elements reading across the top row of the transition metals. OK, and there are another couple uh, um, of other common um, high entropy alloys. Just to give you some um, back, uh, some uh, background on the publications, the numbers of publications of high entropy continues to rise dramatically. So if we, if I, I did a scope of search uh, in August for super alloy and for high entropy alloy, and you can see here that last year, actually the number of papers that um, had uh, high entropy alloy in the title surpassed super alloy, 
uh, for, for the first time and now they're actually well ahead and this was in August and I can imagine this is this gap has grown and we're probably aiming for over 3,000 publications this year on high entropy alloys so it's a it's it's really has um, uh, be, be become quite a hot topic in metallurgy and high entropy alloys are um, and, and their compositions are supposed to give rise to special effects and there are four of these effects and they refer to as the core effects and they are that the solid solutions should be entropically stabilized that they should have uh, severely distorted lattices because we've got lots of different atoms of different sizes they should have sluggish diffusion kinetics due to differences in atomic environment as we move through the lattice and there's also another um, uh, effect called the cocktail effect that is referred to is uh, essentially something to do with the unusual properties from complex composition. So, comp uh, so uh, unusual combination of elements. And what I'm going to do to uh, at the start of this um, presentation is just go uh, through and talk about each of these effects in turn and about the uh, um, the evidence for them. So, if we talk about uh, entropic stabilization to begin with, um, we're uh, Hopefully many of you are, are familiar with the idea of configurational entropy of mixing. If I have a pure substance on the uh, uh, left hand side here, the configuration of entropy of mixing is essentially zero because um, uh, the number of ways, in, uh, unique ways in which I can arrange that system is uh, zero. It is one. So it's uh, um, and we log that and we get uh, zero. Uh, and as soon as I start adding atoms into that system, I increase the configuration or entropy of mixing. And the idea is that if I have a higher configuration or entropy of mixing, so I have a higher entropy term here, that means that the um, solid solution that is formed has a, um, a therefore a lower Gibbs free energy term. OK. And um, the most extreme case is where we uh, or some some examples of extreme cases are where we add five elements each at 20 percent uh, at 20 atomic percent we generate uh, quite high entropies of mixing uh, then and the idea is that the uh, that the Gibbs free energy um, uh, that you uh, uh, reduction that you get from that um, uh, increase in entropy um, outweighs the, um, the 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 driving force to form intermetallic compounds so actually in high entropy is the idea of we shove more elements in this the uh, the random solid solution should be should be more stable or should be stabilized relative to intermetallic compound formation. OK, so that's the entropic stabilization idea. Um, so, yeah, yeah, just in words, then it should I uh, this should outweigh the driving force to form detrimental and metallic phases. And therefore, we should find many high entropy alloys with simple solid solution structures. OK. And initial investigations of high entropy alloys sort of supported this idea, but more recent studies have basically uh, indicate that actually it's fairly rare that we find high entropy alloy solid solutions that are stable across a full range of temperature. So uh, uh, really um, a quite a classic example of this now um, is in fact uh, the uh, Cantor's alloy, and this is stable as a face centre cubic solid solution at high temperature, which is actually quite um, uh, uh, an, a, a noteworthy thing, right, because most of these elements don't uh, form um, uh, face centre uh, face centre cubic structure at room temperature, uh, but they do when you mix them all together at high temperature, uh, and so you get a lovely homogeneous um, uh, mixture of um, atoms like that, um, uh, and a nice solid solution structure like, uh, that, that looks like that. Um, but if you actually age these at lower temperatures, you start to form other phases. So this is a sigma phase that, for instance, forms, and at low, uh, lower temperatures still you form uh, you can form bcc chromium for instance and, and some other um uh, some other phases okay so actually the evidence for the entropic stabilization effect isn't particularly strong so there are there are very few five component high entropy alloys that are stable to intermetallic formation but there are perhaps some quaternary alloys that are stable so if you take out the manganese that that might be a stable system and um, but many um uh, common alloying additions like all these elements because of their size difference and because of the enthalpy um they usually lead to some sort of decomposition okay so they um uh, high entropy is still unfortunately um, or fortunately depending on where you look at it still follow the hume rothery rules and enthalpy still dominates their microstructures um, in general so that's uh, entropy stabilization. Let's move on to the severely distorted lattices. 
So um, the idea here is that due to a, um, the size mismatch of elements, we have, uh, and this is exaggerated here, obviously, we have a, um, a lattice that looks like this. So it's a locally distorted at at lattice because of the change in um, uh, atomic environment. Now, this sort of a, a distortion doesn't broaden X-ray diffraction peaks like dislocation do. Instead, it essentially uh, in, uh, increases the amount of, of uh, incoherent scattering uh, and the damping associated with that, and it reduces the peak intensity a bit like temperature does, really. Okay, um, and yeah, so um, I've been I've been very fortunate to work uh, to to be um, associated with some work that's trying to probe this probe this uh, this this sort of lattice idea in uh, in in high entropy alloys, and um, so. What uh, a, a very good measure of this is something called a pair distribution function, where essentially we measure the distances to our nearest neighbours uh, in our structure, and the width of these peaks essentially tells us how much distortion there is uh, within the structure. Okay, and um, uh, some uh, much more clever people than I am. So uh, an example of that would be Lewis uh, Owen, uh, who's now at the University of Sheffield. Um, essentially, do um, they do neutron diffraction uh, measurements, uh, total scattering measurements like this. Fourier transform that, and then they generate uh, pair distribution functions um, that can then be compared with uh, with various models. And you can see here that if we compare the um, the, the widths of these peaks, you might be able to convince yourself, OK, that the high entropy alloy is, it does have a, a greater um, peak width here. However, when you account for things like the fact that the melting point will increase, uh, will increase in this direction, so will decrease down here. So in other words, this is a, a this is going to have greater thermal vibrations going on in the structure. The effect really is, um, is not a strong one. OK, um, and the problem is, is that you might think, well, OK, this obviously won't uh, be an example of a severely distorted alloy because all these elements are next to each other. That's true. Unfortunately, when you try and make a system which does have, which should have a lot of distortion, it then becomes more tricky to measure because often you have phase decomposition then. Anyway, if you're more interested, if you're interested in this, I do recommend these two reviews by uh, Lewis and uh, Nick Jones. Um, uh, Lewis, has, uh, as I say, uh, said now, is at the um, uh, University of Sheffield, um, and there are these two um, uh, reviews that I do recommend um, uh, you having a look at. Um, and all the references are actually in the list at, at, um, at the end of my uh, presentation here. They say, um, uh, to quote them, there remains very little experimental data related to the level of local distortion in hydrogen alloys. Um, and that uh, the, the measure of the metallurgical community does not have a good quantitative appreciation of the magnitude of alloying related to atomic displacements in any system. So actually, there's a lot of work to be done here. OK, so um, that's atomic, uh, that's a severe source of lattices. There's not very much evidence for them at the moment, but then there is still lots of work to do. So what about this third one? This is sluggish diffusion. So the idea here is due to variations in uh, lattice potential energy, rather than surfing through a con constant uh, potential landscape, um, as would be expected in a pure substance, instead we've got um, uh, areas where the, uh, the atoms might become trapped and that should give us sluggish diffusion. Well, if we look at um, lots of high, uh, quite a few high entropy alloys and we look at their aging response as an indication of how fast diffusion might be, we actually find that, well, this is within six minutes and 900 degrees C, we're, we're uh, in an hour and then uh, 10 hours, we see that, um, yeah, there's, the fusion isn't ridiculously slow, certainly in comparison to what we, we see in lots of nickel alloys, OK, here in the development of microstructure. And actually, people who've, who've done proper diffusion calculations and diffusion studies, um, uh, so this, um, I, I don't know whether this, uh, the surname here is Dubrova, uh, but uh, um, anyway, th this um, is uh, a great paper that talks about um, the state of a lot of, of uh, diffusion uh, studies in nitrogen alloys, and they conclude that based on literature analysis, it can be stated there is no experimental evidence which would support the existence of the sluggish diffusion effect. Um, nevertheless, it can be pointed out that our current state of knowledge in the diffusion of HGAs is far from complete. OK, so it's a similar effect. It's a similar sort of story to the, the lattice distortion um, uh, business. And um, what about the cocktail effect then? Well, this is a tricky one. It's supposedly the overall effect from composition, structure and microstructure. But it's difficult to work out whether people, when people talk about this, it's any different to really what you what you find in standard concentration alloys like 
uh, super alloys or austenitic stainless steels. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, it's the idea that the complexities of high entropy uh, compositions give rise to unusual properties, and sometimes they do. We'll talk about that later. But is this particularly special to high entropy alloys? Um, uh, that remains to be um, debated. OK, so in summary, this was sort of a whistle stop tour through a general introduction to high entropy alloys. I would certainly uh, say, and this is, I guess, my opinion rather than anything else. And, uh, and if you're interested in this, um, uh, uh, there's this um, review down here that I wrote with Nick Jones in 2016 that talks a little bit about this. Um, there's limited ev evidence that the four core effects play a significant role in determining high entropy alloys properties. Um, this certainly seems to be true in terms of the being, there being universal application to all high entropy alloys. So I can't say that all high entropy alloys have sluggish diffusion because that certainly isn't the case. OK, that said, though, there's still plenty of work to do as, uh, on lattice distortion, diffusion, uh, etc. And I'm about to talk about um, the fact that there's still a, a great opportunities to study high entropy alloys, despite the fact um, that these core effects um, uh, uh, may not be so strong. OK, so, yeah, on the basis of that, as I was just uh, alluded to, um, you might ask, well, why bother with high entropy alloys at all? OK, well, I would argue that and lots of them in the community still argue that uh, they represent a an exciting opportunity for our development and enhancing our understanding, particularly of, of, of solid solutions, concentrated solid solutions. There is enormous unexplored space for us to design alloys in, um, and uh, the alloy de development is still worthwhile regardless of the influence of the core effects. OK, so there are still certain applications, and we're about to talk about um, uh, uh, a set of applications where it's still worthwhile pursuing them, despite the fact that they might not all have stockage diffusion, for instance. OK. Just to, um, ju I'm not going to talk today about um, mechanical properties of high entropy alloys in great detail, but just to um, just to mention that um, there are certain high entropy alloys and related systems that have really shown exceptional properties. OK, so um, this is the uh, Cantor's alloy over, over here, and this has been tested at room temperature and all the way down to liquid nitrogen temperature here. And unusually uh, in an alloy system, um, the strength and the ductility both increase as you drop the temperature. And uh, in fact, if you um, take manganese and, uh, and uh, um, an iron out of this system, OK, it, doesn't, it becomes less of a high entropy then, but um, this is what people have, it's been derived from this work. You actually find that you get even better properties. Um, and these are, I think, to my knowledge, the toughest materials, that have, uh, toughest alloys, at least, that have been um, measured at cryogenic temperatures. OK, so you can get similar behaviour to this in terms of an increase in UTS and ductility with a drop in temperature uh, in some austenitic steels uh, and, and other austenitic alloys. But this particular, the, 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 the um, strength of this behaviour, if you like, is um, particularly exceptional in uh, these high entropy alloy derived systems. So, um, yeah, there are even if those these don't necessarily display lattice distortion, for instance, they do display some very in other interesting properties. OK, I'd like to argue that, um, um, and like many uh, others do, that the development of high entropy alloys is likely to be most beneficial for uh, applications where our current alloys don't limit us. So we're not going to displace, we're not going to um, ever be able to generate high entropy alloys that displace um, you know, um, steels or aluminium alloys in automotive applications or steels in structural applications, etc. Because the, on a cost basis, we're just never going to, uh, they're, they're just, high entropy alloys make no sense at all. Uh, so a cost and property basis there and the specific property basis, they, they make no sense. However, there are some applications um, such as um, maybe high temperature gas turbine applications um, where they do make sense. And uh, my particular interest is around fission and fusion applications. So these are next generation nuclear applications where the environment is very uh, severe and uh, there's um, a question mark about whether our current set of alloys can um, uh, can work in in these uh, in, in such applications so if you're interested in this um, here's another um, uh, review that I wrote with a number of uh, co-workers here um, on specifically uh, nuclear applications uh, of high entropy alloys and I'm just going to summarize some of the findings uh, in the next few slides okay
So if we look at um, uh, the, ca the current candidates for fusion materials, uh, so mat plasma facing uh, um, uh, materials that go inside a fusion reactor, um, we see that um, we have quite a few uh, mat uh, um, materials here that are um, uh, yeah, that the, the seem to span a decent temperature range, uh, OK, and, and they tend to be limited by radiation embrittlement, low temperature, and maybe creep at high temperature, for instance. Um, and you might think, oh, great, you know, we've got we've got all the materials that we need here. The problem is that to make a lot of these materials, so for instance, oxide dispersion strengths and steels in large quantities is uh, really difficult and we'd be trying for a long time so there are lots uh, and and it's not just um that might be the the problem with the ods steels but in other cases there are other problems um that that mean that none of these alloys is quite perfect when it, uh, cert well certainly not perfect when it comes to fusion app uh, applications and they might just not work they might work but they might may, they might not work and we might not be able to make for instance enough uh, uh, enough tonnage of them to even uh, implement them in, in a fusion reactor so there is there are some gaps here for um, for for producing uh, high entropy alloys. OK, now what I'm going to talk about um, uh, in, the, in the following slides does involve um, uh, a little bit of uh, discussion about what radiation damage is um, uh, or about radiation damage defects in the formation of them. So I'm just going to outline that for those of you who haven't studied radiation damage before. I certainly hadn't before, you know, um, three or four years ago. Um, so both, uh, so in a very, very basic way that probably will make some uh, radiation damage people cringe, I'm going to um, uh, explain um, uh, radiation damage. What generally we have is uh, some sort of energetic particle. The energetic particle is in red here, and that comes in and hits uh, uh, um, an atom within our structure, and that creates um, a vacancy, uh, a vacancy in interstitial pairs, and these are Frenkel defects. So we create lots of vacancies in interstitials. Now that actually isn't what happened when we bombard a, an energetic particle. And what tends to happen is something like this. So if I just play this for you, we have an energetic particle coming in that then hits and uh, that then hits and knocks on a particle that then hits, uh, hits and knocks on a load of other particles, et cetera, et cetera, until we have a what's called a displacement ca uh, cascade. And this is, I should acknowledge Bartak here at Manchester who's um, given me this animation of one of his um, uh, simulations. And we see that what we generate is voids. They're not immediately obvious here because we've got a number of, um, uh, not, they're not void, sorry, uh, I mean vacancies. So we have a number of uh, vacancies here. So vacant sites are not immediately obvious because we've actually got a number of atomic layers on top of each other here. And we can also see some interstitial atoms here in green. OK, and essentially what happens is that as they, uh, that these interstitial atoms and these vacancies depending on the temperature and the various other conditions, they move around and they can form things like voids, if vacancies uh, agglomerate together, or um, dislocation loops. And these can, dislocation loops can actually happen when vacancies and, and or um, uh, uh, interstitial atoms um, uh, combine with each other, OK? And obviously, these are going to change the properties of the material, OK? So that's a very basic idea of what irradiation, of how irradiation damage works. So many, uh, a number of people in the past few years have been asked, uh, asking the question, do high entropy alloys possess special irradiation properties? So do these possess properties that are more special than, than uh, other um, uh, conventional alloys? And there are some studies that have found that high entropy alloys show superior resistance to irradiation defect formation. Um, so, for instance, in face and cubic high entropy alloys, we've, we, they form small and more, more numerous dislocation routes or reduced voice swelling. And here's an example of that here. So we see that when we irradiate nickel versus when we add in uh, elements, uh, more elements, we see the amount of voiding and the vo and void swelling goes down significantly. OK, so that's um, uh, a very uh, that's a, a, a very, very interesting result. Um, other things um, um, some we found that some high entropy alloys uh, uh, undergo significantly uh, less radiation hardening. So um, the hardening from from all the, uh, the defects that are formed. So, for instance, if we look at the um, uh, this is the irradiated versus the unirradiated state here. Um, we can see that there's an increase in, uh, in vanadium, but less of an increase in some of these concentrated alloys. So that's an interesting uh, observation. 
other things, uh, and there's also been um, uh, some claims, and there were some uh, studies that demonstrate this, that they possess, that some high entropy alloys possess excellent phase stability as well under irradiation. So we radiate them at temperature and they don't seem to decompose as readily as other alloys. OK, the problem is that not that certainly we can't talk about this again in general terms because not all the studies confirm these trends. OK, so some studies, for instance, have found that they aren't stable, you know, they don't show great stability, phase stability when irradiated. OK, um, and in general, um, there is much more work that is needed and there's not a huge amount of um, uh, of, of work out there. If we look at the like the percentage of studies that um, or the, fra or the fraction of studies that um, might be um, uh, focusing on nuclear out there. Of those 3,000 papers, maybe there's like 50 published a year, 50 to 100 published a year that are actually on nuclear um, uh, high entropy, uh, nuclear applications for high alloys. So it's quite, it's still quite a, very much a, an upcoming th field. In general, though, what appears to be the case so far is that things appear to be system dependent rather than use of all to all high entropy alloys. So we can't say that all of them are radiation resistant. Instead, certain systems may be. OK, um, and there's also a question about whether they're actually any different to, to concentrated conventional concentrated alloys. There's been a huge amount of work done in the past on the austenistic stainless on austenistic steels, sorry, for, for nuclear applications. And are they actually any different to, to those steels? Now, if you are interested in, um, in particular, the FCC are high trails, I can rec recommend that this um, uh, review by uh, Zhang Armstrong and, and Grant from, uh, uh, from the University of Oxford that talks about, um, uh, yes, uh, this uh, radiation uh, in these in these cantor light alloys um, uh, in a bit more detail. OK. The final thing to say about this special, uh, these special radiation properties is that many of the studies that talk about special radiation properties refer to those same four core effects I've just talked about. And as we've seen, the universal significance of these effects remains disputed. So you'd expect that maybe if you have sluggish diffusion, that might inhibit void formation and growth, for instance, in some circumstances, or, or may in fact increase it in some circumstances. But um, if, if that was true for all high entropy alloys, then maybe they would uh, they would have uh, some sort of consistent uh, radiation um, uh, damage resilience or, or, or whatever. But that's not what we find it in general so far. Um, and yeah, and, and there's all, I should also mention there's a brilliant review. Um, I think it's about 90 pages long in active material material of high entropy alloys um, in general in, in 2017 by Dan Miracle and Alex Sankoff there. And that I also recommend having a look at. So that all sounds like I've just been very negative again, uh, but I, I'm not. I'm not at all. And I think there's, there is still great pro promise in this area. Um, and the, we can still ask the question: You know, so are there any intrinsic characteristics that could instill damage resistance in high entropy alloys? Well, I'll give you an example of one of them that could be fairly um, universal to, to lots of high entropy alloys. High entropy alloy source solutions tend to have many. Uh, high concentrations of many, and many elements. We know that that's what high entropy alloys are all about. But this means that, and this is good, sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing, that they tend to have lower thermal conductivities. So the question is, so if they do have the lower thermal conductivities, does this mean that when we fire our neutron or proton in the material, we create that damage cascade? Does the energy and thermal energy gets concentrated in that, that cascade for a longer period of time over a smaller volume? That means there's more time for radiation damage defects, uh, radiation defects to recombine. So imagine if the uh, the overall um, uh, thermal uh, um, uh, the, the, the overall thermal spike, if you like, associated with the, the cascade look like that in a conventional alloy. When the, in a high entropy alloy, does, do we get just a more localised um, uh, 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 yeah, a displacement cascade is a, is a thermal energy um, concentrated over a smaller volume. And does this help us uh, in terms of uh, providing chance for, for defect recombination? Um, so that could be a, a one example. Um, it's also worth noting that many stainless steels, of course, and zirconium alloys have low thermal conductivity, so it remains to be seen whether they are any different to those sets of alloys. But certainly it, it's generally true that high entropy alloys have worse thermal conductivities than their more conventional counterparts. So can this, does this um, give you uh, an advantage? 
And there also is a lot of work on here, and it's something that very much an area that I don't really understand uh, very well, um, uh, on short range orders. So there's a huge amount of work and, and Lewis Owen and, and uh, uh, Sheffield and, and others are looking into this uh, in um, uh, in high HP alloys. Um, and yeah, so can there's a question about can short range order effects um, uh, uh, help out and uh, are they unique to high HP alloys? Um, and the jury is still very much out on, on that one. OK, so I've just talked a little bit about the, the motivation for high HPL alloys and, whether, and asking a question about whether they um, potentially possess any, uh, 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 any unique properties. And I want to go on and just talk about the design considerations very briefly. OK, so there is some good news and some bad news when it comes to uh, high HPL alloy design. This, these are true, generally true uh, regardless. Uh, uh, some of these are, are true regardless of whether it's for nuclear or not. And um, the good news for nuclear is uh, specifically is that we have some restrictions on our choice of elements uh, that shrink our palette of elements. And I'll talk about this a bit later. But basically, if you want to avoid lots of radioactive uh, element uh, radio elements that become radioactive we, we that shrinks our uh, elemental palette okay so we might want to reduce activation load uh, neutron cross section etc and um, the bad news um, uh, and this remains uh, this is true for all high entropy alloys is that modeling of high entropy alloys remains a huge challenge if knowledge of the system is required beforehand um, and this makes screening of alloys really problematic for, for any sort of application and in particular for radiation damage because there we've got lots of com uh, complicated effects going on. Um, and the, also another bad, uh, set of bad news, I mentioned before that ODS steels were difficult to make in bolts. Well, often uh, HBLs are difficult to make in bolt too, particularly if you've got very different uh, melting temperatures uh, amongst the, the, the elements, okay? And again, another um, uh, great review on um, uh, that I recommend if you are interested in uh, design considerations for nuclear applications in general, uh, HEAs do check out this uh, this review here. Um, just uh, to focus in on one specific uh, other consideration, there's a question about whether we should use face centre cubic or body centre cubic alloys. Um, so. In some ways, this is sort of answered for us because many face into cubic forming elements uh, are not favourable from an activation standpoint. So if you irradiate nickel and copper, cobalt, for instance, they, and, and uh, copper as well, uh, they can become very, very uh, active. Uh, and this is not a good thing. And there's the general sort of underlying uh, on this, um, uh, theory that, that face into cubic uh, structures also form more voids and they swell more um, readily than their body centre cubic clamped parts, although that's certainly not always the, uh, true. Uh, oh, and there's a, a little bit of change in formatting there. And uh, so, so that's so that's against the FCC. Um, for the BCC, in terms of the BCC, then um, there are some BCC low activation elements to choose from. That's a good thing. Um, they should, in theory, be more resistant to swelling. Although actually, that the jury is still very much out on that front. I mean, if you add if you have vanadium iron alloys, for instance, they've been shown to swell a lot. Um, Problematically, though, they tend to be brittle. They tend to have poor accrete performance, so the same homologous temperature uh, and interstitials in body centre cubic, uh, in particular body centre cubic refractory alloys, are, um, are a real problem. Uh, so, yeah, hydrogen, carbon, et cetera, et cetera, are a real problem. Um, and just to, get, to illustrate the, the, the problem, um, many of the uh, body centre cubic alloys that you might think are suitable for nuclear applications are actually also being looked at for um, uh, for hydrogen storage as well. OK, so you, for hydrogen storage, of course, this means that they store hydrogen and then they also give it back out. So you should be able to spit the hydrogen back out again. But in general, if you're if you're, for instance, in a fusion reactor and you've got lots of tritium and deuterium and all sorts of things flying around, um, and radioactive tritium and tr tritium that's quite precious for you to keep uh, for, to keep within the fuel cycle, um, then it's a problem that it gets locked up in your materials and probably in brittle of those materials. So, yeah, there are a huge number of uh, of, uh, of considerations uh, um, to, uh, out there when it comes to the nuclear, but it is still um, a big opportunity and, I, and I'm again I've talked a lot about the limitations maybe that's just in my um, in my nature that um, uh, there um, but the compositional space of forging laser by by hydrogen uh, means there's lots to explore and, and there are lots of um, unique opportunities to uh, to tune a radiation response oh yeah
Good, you okay? Nice how was you. How was the uh, oh, trip to people. Iran? Um, so uh, yeah, uh, the basically the 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 high uh, there's a, um, a a big opportunity to tune their radiation response alongside other properties. Um, so for instance, can we use compositional freedom to tune defect strengths and sink strengths and the strength of, of, of vacancy, agglomeration, all sorts of different things like that. Okay, so it's, it still remains a big opportunity. Okay, so in the last five or ten minutes, I'm just going to talk to uh, you about my uh, my group's own research. And um, so I'm we're, we've mainly when we've been looking at time free alloys for fusion applications being considered with plasma facing components. So in particular, the first wall, the blanket, and the diverter that you see sort of at the centre of the, uh, the of the tokamak here, the torus. Um, uh, and these sort of components are going to see really high damage rates. So this is 10 displacements per atom per full power year. So uh, over the course of a year, every atom will get displaced from its site 10 times. That seems like a ridiculous amount of damage. Um, uh, and we want to, at the same time, we want to, uh, we're bombarding them. We want to run them at hot, ideally 800 degrees C, and they need to have low activation elements. So we can't use new nickel super alloys because we don't want to use nickel. OK, um, so my the, the design philosophy that some of my students have um, uh, uh, have adopted um, is sort of follows on from what we just discussed about face centre cubic and body centre cubic uh, alloys. We've used um, uh, low activation elements. We've looked at body centre cubic crystal structures, hopefully. So this means that we get a lower radiation swelling. We've looked at high melting point elements um, for good intrinsic creep properties. And we've also added elements like um, chromium for environmental resistance. And we targeted so solid solutions to begin with, so elements that are compatible, we think are compatible with each other in order to then introduce second phases for strength later on. So this is a really key um, and interesting periodic table. This is developed by um, uh, Mark Gilbert and co-workers at um, uh, UK AEA. And essentially it tells us the number of years here that it takes for this an element to decay um, the radioactiv its radioactivity to reduce to low level waste after it's seen a fusion plasma. OK, uh, for 14 years. OK, so that's might be, a, you know, uh, that's a decent amount of time that um, uh, uh, that has been exposed to a fusion plasma. And we see that some elements that are, are usually quite good elements for for new uh, for for high strength applications like uh, nickel, for instance, are just not going to cut it because they take. Um, I mean, this takes 46, uh, no, 460,000 years. Um, to decay um, to so safe low level waste. And part of the reason, part of the motivation for, for, for fusion is that we eliminate a lot of the long lived radioactive waste. So we're actually, uh, 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 and this is a good thing for HBLs because otherwise we've got too many options. And um, we've uh, we sort of limited our palette and, and my group in particular has limited their palette to these elements here. And specifically, actually, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the uh, combining these elements up here to make lightweight iron tree alloys. Um, other groups, and for instance, the group of Amy, of Amy Gandhi at Sheffield and Dave Armstrong uh, at Oxford, have, have looked at a lot of um, tungsten and tantalum containing uh, iron tree alloys as well. So we've um, explored these systems uh, and we sort of built up our elemental palette um, from the bar, from the unary system right the way to the quinary system uh, and looked at the effect of adding in these elements. OK, so those first uh, those first two, the unary and the binary, very known, uh, very well known um, uh, stable solid solutions. So there's no problem with them. Um, uh, the Chromium manganese, uh, vanadium chromium manganese system appears to be as stable as a single phase solid solution across all temperatures. OK, so when you add approximately equal amounts of those together, they seem to be uh, all good. And um, some work by uh, an ex uh, student of mine called um, Paul Barron um, uh, has, has demonstrated um, that. When you add in titanium to remove some of the interstitials that you often see uh, getting caught up in uh, and when you make these alloys, um, you do successfully um, uh, form um, sort of like titanium oxide, titanium carbon nitrides, and that sort of uh, stuff. Um, and we find that actually, though, the amount of titanium we can add into the system is quite low um, because we uh, before we form some horrible intermetallics. Um, and so it's about up to four weight percent titanium into into uh, an equiatomic 
uh, vanadium chromium manganese alloy we can only yeah, put in a small amount of titanium before um, uh, that, um, that becomes an issue. In another set of work we, we looked at um, uh, adding iron to the system so again building up the uh, elemental palette, palette to, to become high entropy alloy like and uh, what we find in this particular system is that we form a single BCC phase at above 1000 degrees C um, but as you might expect um, given that the, the combination of elements we get here we've got here that we form a, a, a sigma phase at extensively at lower temperatures um, so there are a couple of publications by uh, postdoc um, uh, Alex um, uh, on this subject, um, and um, this is so. This, for instance, is this alloy equiatomic um, alloy at 1000 degrees C, and this is at uh, after 800 degrees C, and we can see that this looks like a lovely um, uh, BCC solid solution uh, almost entirely, and this looks um, uh, yeah. There's lots of sigma phase that pops out here. Now, the interesting thing is that so then Alex looked at um, uh, adding in aluminium into this system to, for two reasons. Firstly, aluminium suppresses sigma phase and you can suppress sigma phase at approximately uh, more than 7% uh, uh, aluminium. And secondly, because aluminium forms B2, so these are sort of like ordered intermetallic phases and um, super lattice phases of the BCC uh, solid solution, the, the aluminium forms these B2 and hoys the phase uh, precipitates um, uh, uh, and that's also a good thing for, for high temperature strength uh, as well and also as aluminium isn't bad for environmental re uh, resistance either um, and um, we found some really interesting mark structures here where we have um, coherent super lattices of um, uh, super lattice phase, uh, B2 and Heusler phases precipitating within the BCC matrix and yeah there's, there's still a lot a huge amount of work to, to be uh, to 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 so um, uh, to um, yeah, still continue with on, on this subject. Um, we are uh, currently doing some bulk mechanical properties, so we've actually made kilograms worth of ingots of, of, uh, of, of this alloy, for instance. We're doing some bulk mechanical property and irradiation uh, testing of, of, of these alloys. We foresee, though, that there will be some problems with interstitials and hydrogen retention and limited ductility in these alloys. So we'll have to see how we get on where, with that. OK, so um, yeah, that's I realise I've gone through things very, very quickly, so apologise. Uh, apologies for that. You'll have to watch the YouTube video and then slow me down by about uh, a factor of half or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so in, in summary, then um, I've talked a little bit about high entropy alloys in general to begin with. I then talked about the fact that um, uh, irradiation properties of high entropy alloys are likely to be as diverse as their compositions are. Um, uh, just as is the case actually for mechanical properties, corrosion properties, etc. They still, however, uh, represent an exciting opportunity for new uh, develop uh, for, for new alloy development for advanced uh, nuclear applications. Uh, so, for instance, you know, can we use that uh, the compositional freedom to tune radiation responses? Uh, possibly. There's still a lot more to do. Um, many more comparisons are need to to uh, conventional alloys, for instance. Um, and something that I didn't touch on so much was, uh, but is worth highlighting, is that they're a vehicle to increase our general understanding of alloy properties and responses. Um, and really, what I mean is complicated is concentrated alloys there, and, and concentrated solid solutions in particular. And the final thing I just want to say, because it would be uh, I, it, I wouldn't be doing part of my job day to day if I didn't do this, is that um, just before we finish, I'd just like to highlight to everybody um, on the call that if you are in, in the UK and I think even if you're outside the UK, that's fine too. Um, if you uh, there are lots of um, facilities that hopefully are mostly uh, complementary or a lot of them are complementary to the ones you have, the great facilities you have at WMG and um, lots of facilities to to access through the Royce Institute. Do check out the Voice website, voice.aco.uk, uh, for for that. There are things like lots of additive manufacturing machines. There are there's a sheet forming press. There's a spark plasma sintera. This is a a strip caster, for instance. Um, lots of uh, funding schemes for free access for that, and we're keen for every, everyone to draw uh, uh, to, uh, to to use them. So if you are interested, um. Check out the Voice website and check an email, uh, drop an email to voice at sheffield.ac.uk. That's where um, a lot of the metal stuff is led out of. Um, and yeah, so um, I think that's all I wanted to say on that front. So uh, with that, I will finish. And there are all the references. Um, if you're interested, you probably can't remember though. I mean, I'm not sure I can which which slide corresponds to which. Uh, but but there we go. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for the wonderful talk and.
I welcome any questions from audience. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I've okay. got my hand up, Prakash. Oh, okay. Hello, Carl? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ed, how are you doing? You're right. Hello, Carl. Yeah, please, uh, um, please have to ask away. Um, I, I guess a general one, two questions, if I might. And the first one's more of a general one about high entrepreneur alloys. Yeah. How, you know, obviously a lot of alloy design now has a lot of, it is starting to take into consideration recycling. And and what, what you're talking about here with nuclear, I guess, is less of a problem because we're too we're so worried about you know how radioactive it is rather yeah, than yeah, I guess yeah, sure. but in the other areas of of HEAs how responsible is it for us to be making hundreds of thousands of different alloys with these very high levels of different um alloy additions because I think we're going to end up ourselves with it later down the road where we're going to be really struggling to to recycle these it, I, again, it's probably slightly probably unfair because you're focusing on nuclear, which is probably the, yeah. the one that is no, probably less of a worry. No, no, but yeah, to, so to answer that question, it's a great question, and it, you're absolutely right. It is, if you're looking at an environmental sustainable, you know, in terms of their recyclability, their life cycle, it's a difficult case to make for a lot of for, for lots of high entropy alloys. They often comprise elements that are expensive that come from areas of the world that you don't necessarily want to so the supply chain there's ethical supply chain issues around a lot of elements that are end up in the high alloys as well and um, it's a it's a yeah it's a really uh, it's a really key um uh, aspect i know that um that brian uh, uh cantor um is doing some i think he's doing some work in this area uh, at Brunel and perhaps Professor Fan can comment on this in the circular um, metals um, uh, um, uh, centre uh, uh, hub that they've got down there. Um, so it, it is very much something that is being looked at. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 um, it's a real problem. It's a real problem for the high entropy alloys. I mean, you might people might say, oh, you know, we're we're doing them for for, for green applications, and we're going to make things stronger, and therefore we use less of them. But if you look at the amount of alloying element we've got here, it it yeah. It's it's a it's a real concern, uh, and they might be difficult pr to produce, and they're even more difficult probably to recycle. Perhaps maybe if we incorporate them into other in, into other streams sensibly, like stainless steel waste streams, they actually they, they might be sort of complementary as master alloys, or you know, as in like you know highly concentrated alloys in that respect. But we've got to be very really really careful about that and about the recyclability of them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's just, and I think once the, uh, like you said, the 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 rate of all these publications for HEAs is going really up faster than the number of applications we're finding for it. So I think once we once the the market finds out what where the sustainable use of HEAs becomes, I guess it becomes more of a question. Then um, my my second question, if I may, again is is, is possibly a, a slightly cheeky one. Most of the, the HEAs that I see are of these quite expensive alloys is there a hea equivalent of something of all the really cheap stuff that we can get our hands on and it, and from a or again from a recycling point of view is there a, is there an alloy that you can make that actually of all the stuff that is really hard to recycle because it's you know you know some of the aluminium alloys where you put it in and and and, and you, do, you just can't recycle it anymore is there is there a hea where it could be or the end of life and the stuff that can't be turned into anything else that's useful is is there one that you can a HEA you can turn into that I, I don't yeah, that's, know that, that's a really I, th I think I think I may have uh, um, heard someone else talk about that before but the idea of like taking all this, all this all the stuff you can't recycle normally and just creating HEAs with it is a really interesting idea a, a really interesting idea nothing really um, springs to mind in, in terms of like uh, an eight high value that is cheap I, don't, I can't think of one really because if i mean nothing's cheaper than iron in general or you know as soon as you start adding elements in you know and uh, uh, adding more elements in you tend to just add in more expensive elements to things yeah. um uh, and yeah so that's a, that's a key issue but I, I, you know th but that that idea um of of uh sort of being able to create high inch values with 
scrap, uh, unrecyclable scrap from other streams might be a, a really interesting one. You should probably publish on that now, Carl, otherwise there'll be a paper on that uh, uh, next week. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a look. But yeah, I guess it's similar to like using all the, your pantry, you know, you when you've yeah, got your yeah, you're yeah. just using all the less rather than having to buy expensive ingredients. And yeah. anyway, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that yeah, talk. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, clear. Yeah, thank, uh, perhaps I can follow that up that, you know, one of the things that um, you didn't comment on, so I'm hoping you can comment on, is what the sensitivity to composition is. So reality, when you make things, it's never spot on what you aim for. So how much sensitivity is? You mentioned a little bit about, say, some of the pickup elements um, yes. and your concerns with some of the interstitials or things like that. But even sensitivity to your aim composition um, what's that for these materials? Yeah, so, so that, that's a great question, Claire. Um, and, uh, and and in fact, this is a sort of a very much um, something that the community is 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 a is a concern for the high entropy alloy community in general in terms of the um, rep, the re reduce reproducibility of results based on nominal compositions. I think it, it depends what what we're and this is saying sound like a cop out, but it it, it depends. It depends on the alloy system and what we're looking at. If you look at um, and what, we're, what we're specifically we're, we're measuring, so if you're um, if you've got like the Cantor's alloy, for instance, small changes in the amounts of chromium, manganese, uh, iron, cobalt, nickel in that system, um, let's say plus or minus two two atomic percent, don't seem to change the results all that much. Um, some people have done some work on that. Um, and so certainly the the, the thermodynamic um, uh, prediction, database predictions that, that, are, uh, that have been uh, done don't suggest that there's there's, there's a great deal of, 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 uh, um, of change in terms of the phases you see and and that sort of stuff if you if you look at that. But but there are so, so that's an example where there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of uh, of, of change. But the, there are examples, and the, the interstitial one that you uh, stated there is a is a real is a real um, uh, critical one where people have measured the properties of refractory uh, high entropy alloys and come up with different answers. Okay, of nominally the same compositions, and this is and, and this is almost certainly due to changes in interstitial concentration. Um, and yeah, so for, in particular for refractory high entropy alloys, there is a big, there, there is still, in my opinion anyway, there is still, a, and, and this you can see some of this in literature, there is a, there is a big question mark over, um, you know, what are you actually measuring here? Have you measured the interstitial concentration? And is this impacting all your other properties? The, the, um, uh, I know that, that Dave Armstrong at Oxford um, has done some historic work where he's looked at um, the effect of nitrogen pickup, for instance, uh, in, in some of these alloys. And you can form totally different phases uh, just based on, uh, on, on quite small amounts of nitrogen. Uh, and if you're not careful, you would think that they are not nitrides, but they're some other phase if you haven't measured the nitrogen. So yeah, it becomes it becomes it becomes really really uh, really really tricky. Uh, actually, in particular with those refractory alloys. So there are some alloys that that seem to be yeah a little bit that they don't mind so much, but then when it comes to to, to other alloys, it's a, it's a real it's a real problem. Yeah. Um, my sort of follow-up question is because because there are lots of issues about being able to make these in bulk, being able to have things that are uh, reproducible on a large scale basis. Yes. What, what, in your opinion, if you had to, I know this is an unfair question, but if you have to, what do you think the time scale is for any of these alloys actually making it into a bulk practical application? And if, if at all, and I don't think there's any problem with saying it may never get there, because there's yeah. a lot of learning that can happen anyway, or, although one hopes that um, it's it's appropriate learning. But, you know, if you had to put your, your money on it, what would you think? Yeah, good. That's a really good question. So there are, there are um, some there, there are sets of high entropy alloys that are already in application. You can already buy off a, off a, 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 a website for brazing, but that's not bulk. Um, <laughs> so so that's that's nowhere near bulk, in fact. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult. It's, a, it's that's a, it's a very difficult question. It seems like you know, with some of these alloys, 
the ones that are approaching like nickel alloys and stainless steels, they're not, you can see, you can, it is apparent you can make them in relative, in, in, relatively easily in bulk, in bulk quantities. I, but I really, I, I don't mean, nobody's made tons of them. Yeah. Kilograms, kilograms of them. Okay. And it seem, they seem to work okay um, there. Um, but when we're talking about the the sort of the high temperature applications, which is I think uh, the high temperature and extreme environment applications that I think we go that ultimately we'll see applications in, right? Um, the really extreme environment applications are going to be really the only applications where we're going to see them in. The alloys that you tend to use in those more extreme applications are just are more difficult to make in bulk. And so I think we're, we're at least, I mean, if I want to, uh, I'd say we're at least 10 years away from using anything um, okay. uh, in, the, in those applications because they tend to involve some really, really nasty so, elements. So to, if, to I ask, if I ask the critical question, that considering the UK strategy for nuclear and the timescales that are required to define the materials before you even start design and build. Yes. Would I would I be fair in saying that it's highly unlikely, if not downright impossible, that the high entropy alloys will be ready for this generation of new build nuclear? That, that absolutely correct. Yeah, and there's no chance that they'll ever. Well, even some some great steels that have been around for decades, they'll ne they're not even going to find their way into um, the generation three. So the standard fission reactors. I also don't think, as you as you might say, that they're going to find their way. There's no chance they're going to find their way into the first um, generation four and fusion reactors. They won't do that, and they're that sort of in the 2030s. It'll only be they'll only find their way probably into the the generation after that, um, or maybe they'll find their the way into those some of those first reactors, those first reactors as test components, right? But they they won't uh, find their way into widespread application. You're absolutely correct. Uh, 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 or, yeah, certainly the, it's it's the opinion I share until those <laughs> that second generation. We're talking like 2040s there. It, it, what might uh, uh, you know, force things along a bit faster is if we try to build the reactors uh, uh, out of the, the current, the, like we build a uh, the step reactor, for instance, um, the UK's fusion reactor out of out of um, uh, our current set of alloys, and they just flat don't work, and they immediately fail within like two months. That would then maybe really force a lot of these more exotic materials into those applications faster. But I still, you know, it's not it's still not going to be in the 2030s. I don't right. think. And then, then a, la a last question for you, Ed. Uh, uh, um, we're a big steel group, and so we're passionate about steels. Yes. You have a background in steel. Yes. What learning how can you take from the work that you do on high entropy alloys and can you bring that back into the steel community to provide even better steels so we have that cross learning um, between them and so are there things that, that you can take out of that work and bring back into the steel community to get an impact so not saying one's better than the other I don't mean that but it's really about taking that learning to try and provide impact sooner in the steel community yes yeah so that's that's a great question so uh, i mean at heart i am still the steel metallurgist right and i sort of do high values as this novel thing on the side um but but i think there is there, there is there is some learning and some um some some uh you know benefit to be had in the concentrated um alloy end of the steel of, of steels and i'll talk about maybe two two examples of where i think it's beneficial firstly high entropy alloys have had to um and, and this one isn't really about learning but it's more about like um the, the you know uh, about other uh, other things uh, other um uh, in the enabling research um, and that is that a lot of the high entropy alloy um work has forced um thermodynamic database um providers to really assess much more rigorously their um, their quater their ter their binary ternary and quaternary systems in a way that they haven't been asked to before, and I think that's only a good thing if we're looking at developing like really exotic high temperature, high strength uh, 
power plant concentrated steels, for instance, you know, if we're, if we're going to introduce all sorts of crazy sort of precipitates and we're going to alloy them a lot, or maybe we're in, introducing some new twi twip steels or, you know, or something like this, I think it's only a good thing that the um, thermodynamic databases are being more rigorously tested um, by the high entropy alloy com community and that that is being fed through into steels. So that's the, the first thing I'll say. And the second thing, uh, the, there is a lot of work that's been done on uh, so, uh, but I've, I've been I've not done this myself, but um, uh, on high on the um, mechanical properties of, of high entropy alloys, and I show some graphs at the start of those exceptional high entropy, uh, uh, exceptional cryogenic properties from from SCC high entropy alloys. And a lot of that work based on like changing, altering stacking fault energy and introducing martensitic transformations or introducing twinning. Um, uh, a lot of that has been led by Dirk uh, Rabe um, uh, um, in, in Germany. That has ha that does have direct read across into some, again, only some concentrated uh, steels, but it does still have a direct read across, it, it read across into those, like the the uh, the twip uh, type steels, and um, yeah, those sort of steels where we where uh, they're quite highly alloyed that we are um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, messing around with, uh, if you like, uh, for want of a better phrase, um, in in that space. Can I think of any examples with respect to like you know our good old um, exceptionally useful um, uh, low alloy steels, high strength low alloy steels? I think that's that's more um, maybe more tricky. Maybe there'll be something in, in the like the interstitial space that'll 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 come across there. Uh, I, I don't know, but um, yeah. So from what I what I can um, so from what I can think of right now, it would be more towards the concentrated steels that maybe there's some read across and some benefit there. Super. Uh, Thanks ever so much. Cool. Uh, Thank you very much. Suresh, are you there? Your questions. I think he left. Oh yeah, we are over two o'clock now, so apologies for that. Oh, okay. Uh, there are a couple of questions by Suresh Babu. Um, you can see in the chat. Okay, wait. He I'll says, are there? Stop, stop sharing my, and then I'll look at the chat. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any differences in the electromagnetic properties of the alloys if they are single phase? Um, yeah, so there, there is there is quite a lot of work. I've I've not really read very much of it uh, at all um, regarding electromagnetic properties because you can um, you know if we take like antiferromagnetic chromium and ferromagnetic iron and we mix them together and we lots of the elements that they end up mixing together have very have very strange or very interesting magnetic properties and then when you combine them together what then happens is a real um yeah is is very much a, a, an area of work i can't really comment on that too much because i've not really read very much on it um i do know that lots of papers say that you should take into account there's a magnetic um, contribution to the en entropy, and you really need to account for this in uh, when you when you're working with high entropy alloys. Um, are the hardness uh, of the magnetism? Are the hardness differences in the radiated materials due to local phase change, or purely due to change in vacancy or self interstitial yeah. concentrations? So that's a good question. You, you can get harness changes for a number of different reasons, and uh, when you irradiate the, these alloys, so you can you can change the phase, just as so I should, uh, said there. So you can change the phase. You can introduce. Um, you can get more and more um, carbides or nitrides or any other precipitating phase. You can end up precipitating more of that, um, and that can be accelerated due to increased diffusion because you've got more vacancies around and all sorts of things. Um, you can also get a, it's cl like classic irradiation, hardening irradiation embrittlement is because you introduce more dislocations because you introduce these interstitial atoms that then form dislocation loops um, uh, and that sort of stuff. So it's a combination of, of all those things that you mentioned there, really. Cool. Ed, we have one more question from Jackie. Can you quickly go ahead? Yes, thanks, Ed and Jachi from WMG and Research Fellow. Uh, I got a question for you. So uh, during the, your presentation, you seem like to challenge the core effects of the hydrogen alloy. And you also claim that maybe uh, BCC does not necessarily have higher uh, swelling resistance to FCC. So when you design your BCC uh, entropy alloy for nucleation application, what's your theory? Then what, what what's your theory that can support your design? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's mainly um, uh, that the 
the elements, you know, I showed that periodic table of elements. There's that yeah. periodic table of elements. And actually, when you look at the FCC elements, um, they are just not suitable full stop because they get too activated. So if you look at things like cobalt and nickel, they're just absolutely out of the question because um, because you 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 um, uh, for for a nuclear applications because they become too radioactive. Yes. So it's almost I, I'm not absolutely sure the BCC is the way forwards, but I can't you can't really go to FCC because of the limited number of elements. There are some other FCC elements, uh, some of the precious metals of FCC, but then there's a real problem um, around cost then. Um, so yeah, it's more out of, I've gone BCC more out of hope and out of necessity rather than um, the, the absolute belief that they're the right thing to do. Okay, so so you when you choose the BCC is because it's less active, and uh, yeah, we we don't know how resistant to radiation will be. We we, we still know yet. Even no, no, even yeah. compared to the uh, stainless steel or the uh, mature steel, you you present. Okay, another question. Sorry, very quick. So uh, as we discussed, so in in terms of publication, you see very high, huge amount of publication about a hundred below. But uh, what's the um, problems or hurdles to for uh, massive production of, uh, of high entropy law and and, uh, and compared to those deals I know high entropy law could also have some uh, not, not necessarily better for example co uh, oxidation coexistence mm. oxidation resistance it's especially when you apply to a high temperature severe environment and also the corrosion resistance could be uh, worse than uh, our steels. So do you have any comments on that? Are you still confident in the <laughs> future of the high entropy laws? Yeah, so I, I'm, it's diff I guess in terms of like um, statistics, you would think that, that given the number of possible alloys that could exist in high, uh, that, could, that high entropy alloys covers, right? It's not just steels. It, it's, it's, you've got, you know, a countless number of alloys that could be classed as high entropy alloys. I'm still confident that they will find some sort of application at some point. I think that, but as I, as I mentioned to in answer to Claire's question, I think we just we are still decades probably away from that at the moment, or at least for in some cases we're decades away from them. Maybe there are there are there are some applications, but uh, I'm talking bulk bulk structure applications mm -hmm. uh, that we're yeah. decades away from. But um, but maybe there are some applications where where they're, they're much much closer. I I don't know. But you you're but you are right in that the, the because we can add lots of things like chromium and aluminium into into them. In theory, they they mm -hmm. could they should be able to give us very good environmental resistance. And there's lots of work on that, although I've not really read up very much on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't see any more questions, and also it's a. Uh quite a bit long time for you after two already 10 minutes passed. So once again, I take this opportunity to thank you, Ed, um, for your time and wonderful talk um, from our group side as well as from WMG.